Thank you again for joining me. I just wanted to ask you a couple of more specific questions just to highlight some specific benefits of doing sports so that it doesn't sound like some of the statement like you should exercise because it's good for your health. I mean, everyone knows that, but people don't still don't really do that. So mm -hmm. I wanted to focus on uh, some specific topics. Okay, let's let's say the first one to be uh, about the connection of doing exercise and uh, attention. If we focus inside cognitive functions, let's start with attention. So the attention, um, the connection, uh, how exercise can affect our attention in general. Sure. So there's probably 30 to 40 years of research now, uh, mostly with older adults, but also with children. So throughout the lifespan, on uh, exercise effects on different aspects of cognition. And clearly, one of them is attention. There are many different varieties of attention. In fact, you have some very famous psychologists and scientists in Israel that study attention from Danny Kahneman to Danny Gopher to David Navone and Ruth Kimchi, on and on and on. But uh, the varieties of attention that have been examined with respect to exercise or focused attention, the ability to focus on some things and, and ignore intrusions uh, ignore things that aren't relevant at the time. An example would be focusing on the roadway as you're driving in Haifa or Tel Aviv or Jerusalem and not focusing on your child sitting in the back seat screaming and yelling, which can happen at times. So uh, how do we learn to focus? Uh, there are many ways, but we know that exercise through years of research can improve your ability to focus on what's relevant, what's important, and ignore what's irrelevant. Another aspect of attention is divided attention. And uh, we do that all the time. Uh, we talk to people, we look at our phone, we're on the computer uh, and a variety of other things. We're not so good at divided attention. We all think we are, but we're not. Uh, but uh, exercise also helps with divided attention. And I learned that many years ago with, a, with my first study on exercise in 1992 that showed that older adults, and they have more of a difficulty dividing attention and attending to multiple things, whether uh, in the visual world, uh, the sound or auditory world or both, uh, but with uh, a brief program of exercise, it was about four months and that was swimming. Uh, there are many different forms of exercise that seem to have these benefits, but in that case, it was swimming, improved the older adult's ability to multitask, to do multiple things at the same time. So attention is certainly, different aspects of attention is certainly one of the skills, cognitive processes that benefit from exercise. Do we probably uh, know anything also about uh, kids, like how probably kids with ADHD can be affected via exercise? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, ADHD and autism, actually, there's been more and more research uh, with children uh, across the world. I, I work with lots of researchers in the U.S., but also in China, and uh, in Europe, and I've worked with researchers in Israel, certainly. Um, and we know that uh, exercise can help uh, children with ADHD focus better in school uh, and, and perform better, uh, but also help uh, children with autism that are diagnosed with autism or Asperger's uh, spectrum disorders, uh, again, focus better, concentrate on their studies and so forth. So yes, uh, exercise has positive effects on a number of uh, diseases and, and disorders, uh, including disorders of childhood, but also uh, disorders throughout the lifespan, things like multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and so forth. My next question is about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and sure. I believe you have some re <laughs> reviews and some research on that as well. Sure, so uh, there are no cures for Alzheimer's. I hope someday we have one or many, uh, but there have been a number of these longitudinal studies that have looked at uh, people in their middle age and older who have been exercisers. They've either walked or jogged, swam or ride a bicycle or do a variety of other things. And uh, folks that tend to be more active physically tend to get, tend to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's at a later date. And, you know, when you, when you think of what we would pay, how much money we would pay for a drug that would give us another two or three years of healthy life, uh, we'd pay anything we had. And in this case, you only have to put on a nice, comfortable pair of shoes, take a walk or take a jog or ride your bicycle or 
or swim. Um, and it seems to buy you some number of years. There are also a number of uh, what are called randomized controlled trials that allow us to establish causality between what we do and what happens. And those studies also suggest uh, benefits for people with mild cognitive impairment, which often occurs before Alzheimer's disease or other age-associated neurodegenerative diseases and uh, cognition and brain health. In fact, we're running a large study now that'll be finished uh, next month with 650 participants. They're older adults. Uh, we're looking at uh, precursors for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the proteins are amyloid, beta, and tau. And we will be examining whether uh, an, an exercise program or either three or five days a week for a year would reduce some of these precursors for Alzheimer's disease. Wow, <laughs> I'll be looking forward to see the results and uh, read your article once you publish it. Uh, and actually, the next question like smoothly follows uh, the narrative, uh, how exercise can affect our memory. I I'm pretty sure we have some data on that as well. Absolutely. So there, again, like uh, attention, there are a number of different varieties of memory. And uh, one of them is referred to as declarative memory that would have to do with uh, if we meet somebody like we're meeting today to remember what we each look like, what we talked about, when we met and so forth. And uh, for that to be successful, that kind of memory, we need an intact hippocampus. That's a, uh, an area in the, in the middle of the brain. Uh, in, uh, in Greek, hippocampus means seahorse. It looks like a seahorse. And uh, it's important for um, putting together, binding things together, faces, uh, discussions, locations uh, in memory. In fact, if we don't have a hippocampus, we live in the forever now, pretty much. We really never have a future. So we know from both animal research and human research uh, that the hippocampus benefits, that its, its health benefits uh, from exercise. And we've done studies using uh, both structural and functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, to look at that in humans and animals. There are other techniques that can be used that we do not use uh, with humans. And we also relate uh, those improvements in brain health, especially uh, of a region, again, the hippocampus that benefits uh, memory uh, to performance. People do better on memory tasks that have to do with binding different things together uh, when they become more physically fit. That's insane. I mean, uh, frankly speaking, I would never call myself like a very into exercise person. But once I did some research, I mean, I was just like gradually reading more and more papers on the topic. Uh, literally, just the info about uh, improving <laughs> the work of hippocampus, improving yeah. attention span. That's something that actually motivates me to do my morning exercise routine. Just yeah, that. that's good. And, and, you know, people often say to me, especially older adults who have not been exercisers, uh, we have this term in the United States, I don't know if it exists in, in Israel, called couch potatoes, people that sit on the couch and watch the television a lot, and you don't get much exercise doing that. But in many of the studies that have been done with, with people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, these people have not been exercisers their whole life, and they, they think that uh, number one, it's too late. I can't improve cognition. I can't improve my brain, brain health. Um, and, you know, I won't be happy doing it and it's going to be overwhelming and I don't like to sweat. And But uh, it's not doing triathlons. It's not doing <laughs> marathons for these older adults. The kind of interventions we do is simply walking or swimming or riding your bicycle. So it's things we do normally anyway. I live in a in a city that's pretty manageable. Uh, it's pretty easy to get around without driving an automobile. And that is the city of Boston. Uh, and I walk everywhere. And uh, when you watch people uh, get, get around the city of Boston, they, they might take a bus or they might take, we have, it's called a trolley. It's like a little train. Uh, but mostly they walk from place to place. And just simply by living in, in the city and getting around, you're getting exercise. I mean, frankly speaking, I do remember Boston and it's such a nice city just for walking. I mean, you yeah. really do enjoy that. You don't really need a bus if you're not going to Cape Cod. <laughs> I mean, but you right. Cape, Cape Cod, you need a bus or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So actually, I wanted to focus on a couple of uh, more questions because exercise seems to be like a happy pill just to cure almost everything. Uh, so I also think there's some data about exercise affecting stress levels and how we like live through stress. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, it's interesting because exercise is a stressor. When we exercise, 
we increase our heart rate, we increase our blood pressure. But but uh, what chronic exercise does, that is getting out every day or every other day and taking a walk, jogging, riding your bicycle or, or swimming uh, does, is reduce the effects of exercise on our bodies and brains. So even though it's a stressor, it's a good stressor, and it tends to reduce the negative effects of um, stressors on uh, our health, essentially. So, yep, there is a lot of research, both with animals and with humans, on the stress effects, uh, both how it increases stress acutely and then decreases stress uh, chronically. So, uh, again, um, you had mentioned that uh, exercise seems to be good for everything. I, I often think about that. I don't know if it's good for everything, but it's good for many things, which is remarkable. <laughs> Speaking of many things, I believe there's also something about uh, mood, like exercise affecting our mood. Yeah, there is more and more research uh, with uh, both folks that don't have disorders and people that do have uh, disorders like depression, manic depression, and so forth. And uh, exercise does tend to elevate mood, actually tends to decrease uh, some of the effects of depression. Um, so uh, even for mental health or emotional health exercise uh, tends to have benefits probably you know some data about uh, exercise affecting burnout because it seems to be like uh, the problem of the modern world the burnout yeah uh, these days i think many of us often sit in a chair most of the day which isn't very healthy we're even if we go to the gym uh, if we have a, a white collar what's what we call a white collar job or sedentary job it's often not enough because going to the gym for one hour a day is just a very small part of your whole day if we sit most of the time. And we're both sitting now. Maybe we should be up on a treadmill exercising or a stationary bicycle or something. Um, but, you know, there there is more and more work on sedentary behavior and exercise. And even getting up out of your chair for five minutes and walking around every hour tends to be beneficial independently of whether you go to a gym or not. So I think for those of us who go to a gym, and I did for most of my life, uh, we think, oh, that's enough. We don't have to do anything else, but it isn't enough. Uh, you know, if you work at a, a physical job, when I was a young man, I used to be a, what they call a household mover. That is when people used to move from one location to the other, you'd have people like me when, when I was young, moving all the furniture, moving the pianos, moving everything heavy. Uh, that's good exercise, but most of us don't do that, and nor would we want to do that. I I turn 70 next month, and I still wouldn't want to go up five floor walk-ups in the city of New York and carrying pianos. No, thank you. I did that <laughs> when I was a young man, and I'm done with that. Uh, I feel fortunate I don't have to do it my whole life. But if you have a job that requires you to move a lot, uh, then that's that's beneficial too. But some of those jobs can be dangerous. I think of you know some of the jobs in the United States that people do. They work in factories, so there are injuries there. So there are trade offs between those jobs that require you to move a lot and the safety of the job too. So. Yeah, it actually feels. Um pretty controversial to me but I mean as long as you're like working with your brain you're literally sitting most of the time so yeah. the next level is just making another effort and like <laughs> pushing yourself to also do some sports because it's better for the brain and yeah. um, it's like the next level <laughs> if you're brainy enough <laughs> you'll force yourself uh, um, well I have uh I'm at home now and uh, I have a stationary bicycle at home that I sometimes I will bicycle, not go anywhere because it's stationary as I'm working. And at work, uh, I'm probably the only person I've ever seen like this, but there must be other people. But I have a treadmill in my office. So once wow. you get used to bouncing around, because of course with a treadmill, you're kind of moving yes. both up and down and moving your feet. Uh, at first it used to give me uh, slight headaches, but after doing it for a couple of weeks, you know, I answer my email often on the, the tr just walking. You don't run because that would be inappropriate in the office, but uh, you can walk on the treadmill and you can walk a couple of miles a day that you wouldn't have done because you'd be sitting most of the time. Actually, I'm a total fan of the stationary bicycle. I never had one, but here we have like two of them in the library and it's absolutely great. I mean, I'm such a fan now. Uh, yeah, I feel um, like, you know, uh, the Elle Woods in Legally Blonde when she's <laughs> running on her treadmill, when she's studying law, <laughs> that's exactly yeah. the representation of a smart <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think you can do that. You can you can learn to do that. And I, I do know people, not 
here where I am in Boston, but I know people elsewhere. Uh, I've talked to people who are running on their treadmill or walking on their treadmill. It's great. Why not? You know, it's. Yeah. I mean, as long as you learn how to concentrate, but that's what you need exercise for because it <laughs> improves your attention. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, maybe that's a more personal question, but uh, what kind of uh, exercise do you also do yourself? You've mentioned the stationary bicycle. You've mentioned the treadmill. That's that's a lot already, but probably there's something else. Well, I've, I, I've uh, actually, when, when I was a young man, I went to the university on an athletic scholarship. So in the United States, we'd call me a jock. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I was also interested in learning and, and uh, being a researcher, a scientist. So I guess I did both. But uh, what I did then was many more things than I do now. I was a, a professional fighter, which is not good for your brain. I was a boxer. It's called a boxer mark martial artist that is not i don't recommend that for any young person man or woman uh it's good to learn how to protect yourself and israel has some very good martial arts but uh to damage your brain not good <laughs> we don't want we don't want to do much of that unless we unless we're in the military and we have to do some things because that's the job in the military whether in israel or anywhere else uh, but there are many sports that are not going to hurt your brain. I, I did track and field. I was a pole vaulter. I jumped over the, the pole. Uh, I played soccer. I was a wrestler, which really doesn't damage your brain to the same extent as boxing. Uh, for many, many years, uh, I've been a climber. I climb vertical walls. Uh, I do snow and ice climbing, sometimes with our military, uh, up in big mountains uh, as part of the training um, I, uh, I'm an avid kayaker. I love to kayak, uh, with my, I have a 32 year old daughter and, uh, she and I like to kayak together. She lives in Boston in a different place. And, and, uh, that's a lot of fun. So, you know, I do whatever I can do and, uh, different things. I think as we, as we're become professionals and work, you know, we have to be, uh, really mindful of the opportunities we have to exercise. And when we're children, we can, we can do it anytime when we're adults. Well, you know, we all have obligations in our life, but I think we have to find the situations. Often when I go places uh, for meetings, for professional meetings, I was in Salt Lake City, Utah a couple of days ago, and that's beautiful because there are mountains and nice places to hike. And so you can go to your meetings and you can take a hike, right? That's fun. That sounds absolutely wonderful. Uh, I can't but ask, uh, do you do kayaking on Charles River? Uh, the Charles River, as well as the Atlantic Ocean, as well as, uh, so I have a uh, uh, a trip planned with my first student, uh, who's now in his mid-60s, believe it or not, my first PhD student, and we're going to go shoot some rapids down the San Juan River in southern Utah, and I, I love shooting rapids in a kayak, too. Most of the younger people don't want to do that because they don't want to get hurt, but it's something I've done my whole life, so. I'm going to do uh, that. Uh, and also, I just wrote it down. Uh, I think there's also some uh, data showing that if you have some kicks in the head, it actually get you the higher chance of getting Alzheimer's disease or maybe some other cognitive impairment. Yeah, actually. certainly there, there are a lot of predictors of age-associated neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's being... Uh, unfortunately, the most frequent one, but uh, having brain damage is, is one of them. And uh, smoking is another, drinking too much is another. Yeah, there are a number of predictors. And, you know, we do the best we can in controlling them when we're young. Sometimes we do things we wish we didn't do uh, when we get older, but, you know, that's life. Uh, we do the best we can. Yes, I've, I've done studies on what, what is called traumatic brain injury and concussion. And my students, uh, we were particularly interested in what happens when you've had the injuries when you're young and now you're middle-aged in your 40s or 50s or in your 70s and 80s. So we had people who had had uh, concussions or what they call mild traumatic brain injuries uh, when they were young before the age of 24, and now they were in their middle age or they were older. And, you know, the effects of aging tend to be synergistic or multiplicative almost with the injuries you've had when you're young. And my students said to me, Art, well, you should Maybe you can be in the study because you were a fighter, you were a boxer. And I said, no, no, I can't because we have a limit of four injuries. And I've had dozens of, of concussions. As, oh of course, if you're a fighter, it's not like the movies. It's not like you don't get hurt. You do get hurt. And that's the sport. You know, if you play hockey, you probably have brain damage. If you play football, American football, you probably have brain damage. Uh, if you're in the military, I hope not too much, but 
things blow up and you have brain damage, right? So these are things that happen in life. But the interesting thing is that people that tend to maintain reasonable levels of fitness tend to be more immune to some of the cognitive effects, the memory effects of, of these kinds of negative experiences. And I've been given the number of concussions I've had, both as a fighter and a number of years ago, I was hit by two cars when I was crossing the street. They ran the red light. They hit me at 40 miles an hour. I got hit in the head, flew 40 feet in the, in the air and landed on my head. And no, uh, no effects. So uh, maybe a lifetime of exercise has been somewhat helpful to me, too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's like the cognitive reservoir, like you literally built up your neurons. Uh, actually, yeah. that's an, another question I had. So uh, when I tell my friends, like, okay, exercise is good for your brain, uh, they usually ask me to explain it logically. So what they say is like, okay, I'm exercising. It's about my muscle contraction. How can this even affect my brain? Could you probably please enlighten yeah. them a little bit? I will show them this piece after that. <laughs> Absolutely. So we, again, we have animal research and human research, and we can use different techniques to study animals and humans. And what we found is that there are multitude of interesting changes when we exercise, whether we're a rodent, a beagle, a dog, or a human. And these changes include new, new neurons in areas that generate neurons throughout the lifespan. The dentate gyrus of the hippocampus is one of those regions. And again, the hippocampus is necessary for many forms of memory. So we get new neurons, we get new connections between neurons called synaptogenesis. We also get new vascular structure, that is new uh, veins to supply blood to different regions of the brain. That's called angiogenesis. We get increases in the production of various neurotransmitters, the chemicals that help uh, different regions of the brain, whether it's neuroepinephrine or dopamine or acetylcholine, communicate with other regions. Um, changes in nerve growth factors that support all of these uh, structural changes in the brain, like brain-derived neurotrophin factor and insulin-like growth factor one. Uh, we also get improvements in the efficiency of the mitochondria. Those are the little energy factories that exist within the cells. So there are a whole bunch of interesting changes that occur in the brain and essentially make it healthier. And when you look at uh, older um, exercisers and older athletes, uh, brains, they tend to look a lot younger. Not not mine, because I was a fighter again, and you know I've had some damage along the way. But the interesting things is, uh, is that the brains are pretty plastic. So either, even if you've had some damage, if you're an exerciser, that tends to reduce the damage to some degree, and therefore support better memory, reasoning, problem solving, attention, and so forth. So there are a whole bunch of physiological, neurophysiological changes that occur and, you know, if your friends want to read uh, a paper or two, there, uh, there are Scientific American papers and others that, you know, don't require that you have a PhD in physiology or neuroscience to, to read them. And you'll still learn, wow, you know, there are all these interesting changes. And the, uh, I often do presentations. Uh, I study humans for the most part, but I have lots of friends that are molecular and cellular biologists. And that's where I started out in my career. So we can talk about... Um, these changes in the brain that occur from rodents all the way up to humans. And they're very, very similar. I mean, because our physiology isn't that different. There's some things that are different, but you know, the basic function of our brains is, is pretty similar from rodents to humans, believe it or not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a brain researcher myself, uh, especially as a memory researcher with a special love for hippocampus in my heart and brain, for sure. <laughs> I totally agree here. Uh, yeah. So uh, another obvious but important question is um, what kind of sports is preferable? Like, okay, you got me that exercise is great. Exercise is fine. I'll do it for my brain, for my health. What should I do? Like, what's the best option? Yeah, I think at different ages, different things, right? So for children, simply running around in the playground for 20 minutes or a half an hour is great. Uh, because the kids are often playing a sport with other children. So they have the social interaction, by the way, is good for your brain too. So to the extent they, they play together and play a game, whether it's basketball or anything, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Team-based sports are, are great. Uh, for uh, young adults, um, you have it's nice to push yourself a little bit. Maybe uh, for for us older folks, walking briskly might be enough. But for people like yourself, perhaps a little jogging would be good. 
uh, or riding your bicycle. So you work up a sweat because you're, you know, you're working as hard as you can. Um, pretty much any sport that gets your heart rate up. So we call that aerobic that uh, increases your heart rate. Uh, it's not that uh, resistance sports, uh, things like lifting weights aren't good for you. Uh, and we we know, we've actually known much more about aerobic sports, things like walking or running or, or swimming or bicycling uh, for a much longer period of time because animals and humans can do sim simple, uh, similar things. We have running wheels and cages for animals and humans can you know, walk outside or what have you. But for lifting weights, it's a little harder to get rodents to lift weights, but it is possible. There are ways to do it. Uh, and now we know that even resistance sports like lifting weights uh, is good for your brain. That's work done by Teresa Lou Ambrose. Teresa is uh, in the medical school at uh, University of British Columbia in uh, Canada, and she and others have done uh, this work. We've done some, but it's mostly Teresa's work. So we know that pretty much any sport, and even sports that don't raise your heart rate, like yoga uh, or Tai Chi, when you do it for, for exercise, is good for many aspects of cognition too. And, and uh, I never realized how hard yoga was until I had surgery on one knee and I needed to become more flexible. I thought it was good maybe for flexibility and it indeed is, but to, I don't know if you've done yoga, but to hold those poses requires strength too. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons why I haven't tried. I, I mean, my mom was a yoga fan and huh? I, I could see that she wasn't having like a nice relaxed time there. <laughs> No, it's not it's easy. Like really no. pushing it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I chose squash over that. Like squash. Yeah. Yeah, hitting the ball, running around. I'm still young. <laughs> I'm still up yeah. for that. <laughs> Probably. Like I, that, I right? used to be a competitive squash player, so I do know about that as a young man. Oh, yeah. And uh, I don't play competitively anymore. We have this new sport in in the United States that's supposed to be good if you have bad joints, which I've had eight surgeries on my legs due to. It athletic injuries, mostly skiing and climbing and all kinds of stuff, but it's called pickleball. And I always, I want to play, but I haven't played yet. I don't know if they do it in Israel. It's a smaller court than a tennis court. And it's played with a, a wooden racket with some holes in it to, to make it easy to swing. And then with a plastic ball, it used to be called a wiffle ball. So it's a little slower. It doesn't require you make as many lateral movements. And, you know, when you get older, you might have problems with your knees or your hips or your uh, your ankles. For me, it's just the knees. But uh, yeah, that's another game I'd like to play when I get close to a court because I used to play all kinds of racket sports too. Yeah. Right, well, squash is a great game. It re also requires a lot of skill, right? Because you have the telltale at the bottom of the court. So you have to, can't hit too low and you can't hit too high. And so it requires accuracy as well as speed. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's also like super fun, like knowing that it also improves your brain function as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Not just giving you mood vibes. Yeah. Wow. So I have just like a, a couple uh, last questions. And sure. um, one of them is like, why don't people do sports? I mean, uh, I'm not sure about you, you but as I mentioned, uh, for me doing sports for a pretty long period of time was not about entertainment, wasn't about having fun. It was about forcing myself like into doing at least something because I knew it was good for my brain. But I mean, for now, after like a couple years or maybe three years of such routine, I've switched into having fun, finally. Mm -hmm. uh, but most people don't. I mean, they go to the gym for the first time, maybe for the second, they suffer and they're like, well, I I'm not doing any it anymore. So why do you think people don't actually do sports, even if they know how important it is and what can be done about it? Well, I think I think you mentioned the important word, fun. So people ask me, what sport should I do to, to make a healthy brain? And my, my question is, what do you like to do? Because if you don't enjoy doing it, you will not do it, right? If it's something that's aversive to you, you're not going to do it. So you might enjoy walking with friends and, and talking. Uh, you might enjoy going on a bicycle uh, trip with your partner. There are many things we can enjoy. I mean, I always, I, I think... Growing up and having my dad was a professional athlete when he was a young man. He was a, he was a fighter. He was a light heavyweight boxer. So he did something I wouldn't do with a child today because because we, we know more. But he taught me to box when I was eight years old. That's not good for a young person's brain. But we didn't know that in the 1950s and the 60s, just like we didn't know that smoking two packs of cigarettes, you, you probably get lung cancer, right, if you do that kind of thing. 
we know that today, so we shouldn't do it. That's why when I see young people smoking on the street, I think, God, you guys, you should know about this. This is not good for you. This is going to hurt your health in the long run. Uh, I guess we don't think about getting old when we're, you know, 15 years of age. We think we'll live forever. So we don't worry about that. But I think that whatever it is has to be fun. And a lot of people like would enjoy doing, I think, sports with other people. They like the socialization. They like getting together with people. So if that's true, pick a sport that, uh, you know, whatever it is, whether it's playing tennis or playing squash or um, playing basketball that you enjoy because you're with other people. You get to meet people, get to know people. And I am not, and I hope never to live in an old age community, but I do visit them occasionally because we have family members who live in the older age communities and they often have uh, various sports that they do together. And that's great. So the socialization is part of what people really enjoy. Uh, I never had a problem my my life just doing sports on my own, either riding a stationary bicycle or lifting weights. I mean, that's been fine with me because I think as scientists and academics, we don't have to be anywhere to think. We can think wherever we are. We can plan an experiment. We can think about whatever we want to do next. So I could be on a bicycle. I could be lifting weights. It's irrelevant to me, um, you know, wherever I am. So I think I think it has to be fun. It has to be enjoyable. And if you're if you feel like you're suffering, then you're not going to do it. I think that's true. Even in the United States, the I guess the statistic is something like fifty uh, percent of people who join a health club drop out within three months because they don't enjoy it. They don't enjoy going there. I think it has to be part of your life. Uh, for many years, I, I taught at the University of Illinois for many years before coming to Boston. And there I would have friends and I'd play squash and I'd play racquetball and I'd play handball uh, at least three afternoons a week after work. And it was like getting together with friends. And of course it was athletic and it was exercise. So it was both. It's fun to beat people in sports, right? So I'm, I'm thinking back now, my wife has reconnected with a friend from high school who was also at the university. And we met at Stony Brook University in New York, my wife and I, and her friend was there too. And her friend was a really good athlete. And at the time, in the early 1970s, uh, men didn't think women could be as competitive in sports. So we joined up together and we played racquetball, like paddle ball, kind of like squash doubles. And Judy, her name is Judy Kane. Judy and I uh, would compete against all male teams. And when we get on the court, because there were mostly all male teams, we get on the court, they think this is going to be easy. We have a girl here. We're going to beat her. But Judy was so good that we rarely, I think the only match we ever lost was against some pro professional male squash players and we beat all the other men teams so boy did i enjoy that and so did judy that sounds absolutely wonderful <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm so pleased to hear that it's such an inspirational story wow yeah. okay so uh, frankly speaking i've run out of my questions uh so thank you so much uh i feel like it's super important for us scientists to also find some time to share our knowledge to people because mm -hmm. otherwise they have no clue what we're doing there uh yeah, yeah I, i'm extremely uh glad and uh, happy that you agreed for this uh, talk 